my fellow Americans. Yesterday, September 23rd, 2022, a date which will live in infamy. The Grotto Orloff Show episode 601 ahead. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 602, God uh, 602 will air. Um, let's go down to the comic book room, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, see what's going on down there. Ah, damn it. Son of a bitch. Okay. Well, there's a problem I, I'm understanding that uh, climate change is a big problem, man. So I'm going to turn off this light. And, uh, goddamn fucking shit. And uh, this light. <clears throat> it's smart water. That's, uh, I need a lot of that. <laughs> Drew, do you believe in climate change? She's, she says no. Climate change is a uh, figment of your imagination. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's head on down. Oh, shit. More lights need to be turned off. Tonight there'll be a big uh, car show that I will uh, film and uh, broadcast here on this network, this uh, color network. <laughs> Brought to you in living color, ladies and gentlemen. Another light that's on. What is going on, man? This carbon footprint is going to be huge. <laughs> Can't have that. Ladies and gentlemen. All right. And we're back. We've got boxes everywhere in this room, and I'm trying to get it organized, and perhaps that will happen So. Oh, I need my electrical cord for my phone. I left that upstairs in the Oval Office. Let's go back and get that. I'm so worried about climate change. I, I couldn't sleep at all last night, ladies and gentlemen. I was very worried about it. Because uh, yesterday, or two days ago, fall began and the weather got cooler. And I, so I knew that that was an existential threat to our democracy. The seasons change. The seasons didn't used to change. It used to be fall, winter, spring, summer. They were all the same. Uh, I should get a few people unsubscribed. Someone unsubscribed the other day, yesterday, in fact. <laughs> I went down a subscriber. Perhaps because I laugh at climate change. Oh, well. What'll be a real existential threat to our uh, democracy is, uh, is a nuclear war. But uh, hopefully that won't happen, ladies and gentlemen, because that could... Uh, uh, even, I don't know, what what are the best kind of bags and boards to put on your comic collection so they'll survive a nuclear war, ladies and gentlemen? I will have to research that. Okay. Uh, let's plug this uh, telephone in. Last episode, god damn it, you suck. 
we looked at some pretty cool stuff last episode, didn't we? Um, gotta get this stuff organized. Uh, this floor is gonna be clear before this episode's over. That is my goal. That is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, God damn it. No matter how far. Oh yeah, okay, that light hardly does anything. Let's turn on this light. Okay. Yeah, is, is it uploaded yet? Okay. All right, well, um, did you send the speech to Biden? Yeah. Well, what did he think of it? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, all right, fuck it. I'm writing speeches for Joe Biden. I'm the real puppet master. Everyone wonders, who writes the speeches for Joe Biden? Who, uh, it's me. <laughs> it's me. It's been me all along, man. <laughs> okay. You know, this... I always say, I'm not sure. Is it okay if I answer questions? I might get in trouble. Because I, he's getting in trouble with me. I don't like him answering questions, man. Okay. When we last left off, we were looking at this special Joe Orlando issue of uh, The Amazing World of DC Comics, and then the show just abruptly ended. Yeah, Joe Orlando, oh, look at this nice, nice little uh, poster inside from the original artwork for uh, Swamp Thing number 15. Yes, indeed. Um... Yeah, this is the DC official DC fan magazine, all about Joe Orlando, an interview with Joe Orlando. Quite wonderful. Here are the, here are the characters that would be um, stolen for Sandman. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, buy, buy this. It's available. Um, I think they had a copy at... Uh, Duncanville Books, pretty sure. I'm sure Duncanville Books is near. Shit, I'm sure that's near where you live. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, was this in a bag? Possibly. Um, I bought a whole lot of these bags in about 1988, maybe 85. From Lone Star Comics, they're called My Lights, and, and I still have tons of them. I um, I'm not a. I know there are better ones now. My Lights too is what I've been told, but I don't have them. <laughs> Let's see. Here's another issue of um, <clears throat> the Amazing <coughs> World of DC Comics. This is uh, no, September 1975, uh, number eight. I love this on the back. This would be suitable for framing. Superman of America. This certifies this certif this certifies that Bob Rosakis, they, they type your name in there, has been duly elected a member of this organization upon the pledge to do everything possible to increase his or her strength and courage, to aid the cause of justice, to keep absolutely secret the Superman code and to follow the announcements of the Superman of America in each issue of Action Comics and Superman. In witness of which I have this day set my seal and signature as follows. Clark Kent, Superman, that's Clark Kent's real autograph there, ladies and gentlemen. And they got all this stuff, uh, Justice Society of America, 
That's the ad for you to become a member of the Superman of America. Yeah, this is a, a suggested chronology for reading Dead Man. This is the order you're supposed to read your Dead Man comics in. That's a very helpful thing. Oh, boy. Cool. The Haphazard History of Boston Brand. Okay. This is uh, great stuff. When the, the, year, the year and month this came out, these are the comics that were on the stand. You know, damn. That's the one I'm missing. I cannot find this issue. It's here somewhere. Unless it just, um, what do they call it, spontaneously combusted? Because it's in the collection. Where is it? I don't know. There was no one at my house that would have stolen that. No one. Um, and uh, I couldn't find it before the move, so this is not something I'm going to blame on the move. It's got to be here somewhere. But anyway, that, that was something I bought off the newsstand in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and I want to find it. Ah. <sighs> What's a nice guy like Adam doing on a strange planet like that? This has got all the, uh, this is a great issue. Okay. This is a reproduction of a comic book you could get in a box of Pop-Tarts in 1966 during the Batman TV craze. So I guess this is a never-before-published-in-magazine format. This story spotlights the sensational artistry of Carmine Infantino and Murphy Anderson. So, yeah. Unless you bought, you got a box of Pop-Tarts and got this issue, that's the first time you'd read it. So, whole thing on Carmine Infantino. Yeah. You know, I, I'm thinking I should go by. There's a, there's a comic convention today in Des Moines. It's a good hour, probably hour and a half. But who knows how far away it is. I've never been to Des Moines. But I was thinking I should go to this. But I don't have any money, so that's kind of a problem. Unless they just shower me with free comics. You know, that could happen. But, uh... I'm thinking, because all I want is old comics. You know, I understand there are good comics being made today. And if Dave Stevens magically came back, I, I'd probably go to a comic shop to buy his comics. But at this point, I've just pretty much given up. I, I'm, I'm only interested in comics from really before 1975, you know. Once the UPC code came along, they're just not as interesting to me. Yeah, they really aren't. I don't. I just don't care anymore. And it's. Uh, I just get depressed going in a comic store, you know, look, looking at that shit. And then uh, I get depressed looking at the old comics sometimes too. When I realize the kid that owned that bought this is probably no longer still on this earth. Um, or, you know, why does, I don't know. <sighs> okay, let's get this shit organized. Okay, so how are we going to do this? <clears throat> okay. What I really need to do is get an empty magazine box. I thought I saw one of those. Hold on a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's no music playing in here. That's going to... If I don't have music playing, I can't organize properly. Uh, so just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hold on. Um, okay. Oh, the sound isn't very good. That's the problem. So we need the microphone. Okay, can you hear me better? You hear that? Um... Look at this postcard. How about that? 
It's Pier 23 Cafe, the Embarcadero, San Francisco, California. My, my, my wife must have brought this back as a souvenir from San Francisco. Here's an ad for uh, Atari. Oh, that's uh, the Bonnie and Clyde theme from the uh, 1967 uh, Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway film. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so let's make sure this box is all comic book stuff. Oh, let's look at this. The Golden Age of Comics. Let's go. This. Here's a Katie Keene 1949 pinup calendar. Uh, lots of nice reproductions of uh, artwork in here. Got a whole uh, story reprinted by, of the Green Llama. How about that? The thing is, I've got stuff scattered, and uh, okay, is this all comic book oriented stuff? No, it is not. See, that's what I'm trying to fix. Because there's all these, uh, these, uh, these type of magazines are in there too. Sabrina. And here's uh, Mary Jane Watson. Okay, so these magazines need to go somewhere else. And all these Spice Girl magazines. Um, okay. So let's put these over here. Now, there's a Daredevil index of uh, all the issues of Daredevil. That's helpful. What is this? This is um, the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County National Military Park in Virginia. So this is a little souvenir you'd get if you were uh, going to Civil War battle sites. So this needs to be in a box with more history stuff, like Frontier, True West kind of magazines. So, um, all right, so into this box, I can put this Heroes Incorporated, this Rocket Blast comic collector. Let's keep this all comic book oriented in this box, and then I won't be having all these problems losing stuff. Uh, like that All-Star Comics that's disappeared. You know, once I get organized, the shiza will not happen anymore. This Foom 10 that's probably worth about $900, possibly. Yeah, because the other Foams are in this box, and there's the other Rocket Blast comic collectors. Good, see, everything's getting reunited. Remember this movie, Wizards? I mean, it had some problems, but it was a fun movie. It, was, uh, it had some great... Uh, this is right when it had come out, and there was this great pre-production art that was never fully realized, but it was used in the... Oh yeah, this, they're pointing out something here. You guys ever see something you has seen you have seen before? Some of them guys in that film sure look familiar like. So pointing out that Ralph Bashi had a tendency to uh, use other people's ideas, and and obviously that was very much like Cheech Wizard. You know, he went and pleaded to uh, Ralph Bashi to use our crumb and said, I've got to make, uh, it's, it's my whole life, please let me make a movie of Fritz the Cat. And he said, uh, he finally just felt sorry for the guy, he said, yeah, go ahead. He and, and Crumb did not like the Felix the Cat movie, and he, um, immediately upon the release of the movie, he uh, 
killed off Fritz the Cat. Had him get stabbed to death, as I think, with an ice pick in the back of his neck, as I recall. This is not the box with foam, is it? Or is it? Foam. Why, yes, it is. This box is labeled fanzine, so that's good. Now, what is this box? Those are all monster magazines, so that's cool. <coughs> okay. Here's a, another copy of this famous Monsters of Filmland from September of 76. When we first moved to Arlington, Texas, I had had trouble finding famous monsters all over everywhere we'd lived, in San Antonio and Tacoma, Washington. It was no problem in Virginia. It was right there at the bookstore. But um, when we first moved to, in the summer of 76, it was so great to go to the newsstand, anywhere, any any bookstore we went to, and there was famous monsters. And this was one of the first, if not the first issue I found. Oh, and there was Monster Times was everywhere too in Arlington. Except unfortunately it was the last issue. So the famous monsters are in a, some boxes in the closet. So I'm gonna take this to the closet. Here's an issue of Creepy 52. They'd have these. See, Creepy was an anthology horror comic, but Eerie, by this point, had become a superhero magazine. And, ooh, I'm crooked. Yeah, the uh, stories inside would be all weird horror-related superheroes. Of course, Vampirella had always had a story of Vampirella in the front, and then an anthology of... Uh, so, and this was a uh, European, probably Spanish... Spanish art that was brought over by Warren in this book, Dracula. Yeah. This is, some of the artwork would be like this, which was very, not EC-like, but very European-like. My favorite part of the Warren magazines were the great ads in the back, all the monster masks you could get prehistoric model kits, Venus flytrap, everything wonderful. This is April of 1973. Still a good time. Star Wars hadn't come out yet. And once Star Wars came out, then every ad was for Star Wars related stuff. And that's the book I need. Of course, I'm sure a lot of you need it. That's very uh, sought after. This EC book that came out. Um, these are some of the nostalgic books that came out in the 70s, I have that Buck Rogers one. I have that, that this book here. I showed it to you a few episodes back. That's one of the great books, comics. These two books I thought were lost in the mood, but I found them. Um, there's back issues of Eerie. This is something that um, Shudder, the creepy, the modern creepy... Um, Tribute magazine. There's a magazine that comes out now that tries to look exactly like this. They even hire some of the original artists and writers to come back and write for it. Um, it doesn't have these ads. I mean, you can't recapture that time period perfectly. Um, this is a great album. I'm surprised they don't have that framed. Um, you can hear this. All of these records are on YouTube. You can listen to them anytime. I'd recommend recording them because there's no, will YouTube always be around? Who knows? You can get Conan paperbacks. I mean, they had a whole warehouse full of this stuff. There's the Aurora model kits were still available in 73. Damn. 
all of these uh, little gag gift kind of things. Here's some of the magazines they were still trying to sell. They had a, probably a whole warehouse full of them, which is one reason why, uh, you know, Horror Mike and some other people have been talking recently about how these magazines aren't as valuable as you would think they would be with the quality of art that's in them and writing and everything. It's because uh, Warren, you know, see these back issues? They had lots of mint condition back issues and those all flooded the market. I remember seeing at conventions just stacks of mint condition uh, Warren magazines. Uh, here's some posters you could get. The Vampirella poster, you can get the un, the uh, uncensored EC covers. Um, I mean, look at this. I mean, this is just like, as wonderful as this is, it's a little depressing that this stuff isn't available anymore. Uh, now this art works great. Who is this guy? Oh, of course it's great. It's Reed Crandall. Okay, this is an original EC artist. See, the art here, no offense, I think is much better than this artwork that, and that other story we were looking at. Let's see, who is that artist? Watch it be one of my favorite artists that I'm insulting. Felix Moss. Yeah, the Reed Crandall is better than Felix Moss. Sorry if that offends you, the relatives of Felix Moss. Here's uh, back issues of Creepy. And they probably had thousands in their warehouse. And see, this has got a more European look to it. Uh, who's this artist? It looks like... Um, Uh, Adolfo Abalon. Adolfo Abalon. Maybe that should be my name here on instead of Gratuorlov. Hello, it's Adolfo Abalon. How are you doing? I am Adolfo. Adolfo Abalon. Ramon Torrance did this. Yeah. They had one classic EC artist in here. Oh, this this looks very Vampirella looking. This this story. Who is the artist going to be? Ah, Esteban Moroto. Now that's a guy I like. This Esteban Moroto. It's probably Esteban Moroto, right? Look at this ad, man. It's just there's nothing. Be the Warren magazines just had a look that no one else could beat. Okay. This is Creepy 52. I've got a box over here that says Creepy. Let's put it in that box. Where did it go? Here it is. Oh, it's buried under shit now. All the shit I showed last episode, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, on top of the Creepy box. Wow. Let's see. Horror Mike just put a sound check up on YouTube. I'm up against Horror Mike. No one's going to watch it. It's gonna get better. It's gonna get better, ladies and gentlemen. Creepy, creepy magazine. Creepy number one. Creepy number two. It's got some moisture damage at the bottom. I think it was that way when I got it. It was that way when I got it. Creepy number three. You've seen all of these. You're not seeing anything. Yet. Oh, I'm missing four and five. Here's six. Unless they're in another box. Here's seven. See, you know, the Erie publications have monsters fighting on the covers, but they don't have Frank Rosetta having the monsters fighting. Um, here's number eight. Th this was the company everyone was imitating, but 
the other companies tried to go farther with the blood because they didn't have quite the art talent. And that's the same thing that happened in, to EC Comics in the 50s. They had all the artistic talent and the writing talent, and the, these other comic companies tried to beat EC by uh, being more extreme. I need to take some Eeries out of here. Uh, if I take these Eeries out of the back of the creepy box, I can put those into the Eerie box, and then I'll have more room for creepy. Creepy 52. Oh, look, Creepy 97 that reprints the old cover. Creepy 69. Creepy 55, we're getting warmer. That should be the symbol of the United Nations. If I ran the United Nations, I'd use that as, as the symbol in front of the podium up on the big wall. Wall. Oh, I remember this one. This cover. When I, this was uh, during second grade. This cover was on the newsstand. There were some great covers during that time period. I've got two copies of that. Oh, and this is a great one. The special 50th anniversary issue. So that's 50. This is 51. This is 54. Oh, it's got that great Richard Corbin story. That's ultra gory. Um, these are out of order, or are they? No, they are. They're in right order. 52. What is that great cover with the, all the vampires on this? Stakes. That might have been Vampirella. It was around this same time period. Let's see if I can find that. I loved when they had the anniversary issues and they showed all the covers. Um, Shudder tries to imitate that. That's a pretty famous uh, image. They made t-shirts out of that. This is a great one, too. This is one that was done by uh, Ken Kelly. It's, it's really great. But what they did is um, the this picture was created, and then they tried to, they hired a bunch of people to write stories like, okay, tell the story of this picture. So it says, a spaceman, a monster, a god, or a ghoul? Who is the tormented, decaying man? Super special issue. Seven exciting stories tell the tale of this rotting horror. So they did it backwards. They they uh, they had a great cover image, and then they had everybody come up with a good good uh, story. Oh, this is uh, okay. Creepies entered into the word world of sword and sorcery. This could uh, you know since Conan was selling so well. This being. September of 1974. I have two copies of that. I never understood this cover, man. He's chopping off a guy's head, but where's the body? Can you... Where... It's like, where's the body? I never could figure... It's a beautiful painting and everything. I just, like, the head's... I don't know. Perhaps you can explain that to me. Oh, this is a great one. Look at this. That's uh, Creepy 81. And then I remember they did these sports covers, uh, these issues with, with uh, weird sports. Kind of. There was a DC comic called Strange Sports, but th this took it even farther. Um, so they had one, oh, and this was the other companion piece. You know, if I was into sports and had a man cave, um, I would probably, you know, make a copy of this and put it in a frame. Uh, these two together would, because they're both green. Those would, but actually, even if I'm not really a big sports fan, this would probably look pretty cool. 
Graphic Man, if you make copies of these two covers, I bet you'd sell them at that convention you're going to. Um, 84, 84, 84, 84. Yeah, that desk that you saw me in at the beginning, um, I, uh, I intended to create an office for my wife, for her to do all her research and to film her shows. And that desk was my father's desk when he was in real estate after he retired from the army. And uh, that was in his office. And uh, so, you know, we brought it up on the elevator to this level, but then it wouldn't go through the next door. So I said, oh, it's gonna have to stay in this room. And in that room, I put up all these three sheets, these giant posters, and it's like, I was already decorating my wife's office, and there was the desk, and I was like, well, let's get the desk up to the penthouse, the attic, and then she can, uh, so that's really going to be her, uh, her desk, but I thought, you know, putting that desk in front of the, those windows, it looked like, uh, looks very presidential, so occasionally I might do presidential speeches from that, uh, from that desk. I was thinking of running for president in the next election. Uh, Donald Trump called after, yesterday after the rally pretty late, about 10 o'clock, 10, a little bit after 10 o'clock last night, wanting to see if I would run as vice president. And I said, I think about it, but uh, we'll have to see. Okay. This is the one I wanted to show you because this story is great. Richard Corbin's one of the greats. If Richard Corbin was still around and put out new comics, well, I'd be there at the comic store every Wednesday morning. But uh, I just, I just can't, I just can't get into it, man. The new comics. Okay, Creepy 54 from July of 73, that's the summer before third grade, just, uh, no, July of 73, we were probably in the middle of moving from Hampton, Virginia to San Antonio, and I was going to go into third grade. Back. Man, they have nudity right there on the back cover, man. Shocking. Yeah, this is one of those stories that goes pretty far. Yeah, it's called The Slipped Mickey. Beautiful. Looks like uh, the Crypt Keeper. But, uh, The, the, what Corbin was a master of the airbrush, and there was nothing like uh, his his artwork. Really, I loved it. And then when uh, Warren started a uh, uh, Spirit magazine, and um, and they reprinted the old Spirit sections from the black and white art, and then Richard Corbin did the shading on the, uh, Will Eisner didn't like it. Look at how horrifying that is, that image. But it's beautiful too, look at that. It's, this is fantastic. And then this, this cute train is coming, and it's going to crush this guy's skull, I remember this. Look at that. Oh, and then this television. There was a 50s movie about a killer television called The Twonky. But look at this, man. Oh, the television munches her head. So you've got this cutesy image of an anthropomorphic television. You've got the violence, the cartoon sound effect of Chomp. You've got the prurient interest where, you know, you're, you're kind of looking at this woman's backside. It, it, it's, it's a mixture of everything that's wonderful in life. <laughs> um, oh, I don't like it when the dog gets killed, though. Yeah, they have a whole two-page little spread where this, you know. 
I don't, I don't like dogs being killed, man. Don't kill them off in movies. They, you know, just like, um, you can kill, you, you, you know, what was it, John Wick with Keanu Reeves? Um, see, the, the bone comes to life and pulls the dog underground. I don't like that. Um, and look at this page. Look at these monsters. That is so great. Oh, man. Tom Sutton doing art. Tom Sutton was great. Well, he worked for Charlton as well, and he was also... Uh, I think he inked uh, Marie Severin's pencils in some of my favorite Not Brand X stories. You get these three-inch patches, right? There's that Spider-Man uh, record. You can hear that on YouTube as well. Oh, and these are the EC reprints. I just found my set of EC reprints um, just the other day. There's the Vampirella model kit that looks nothing like that, unfortunately, but. There's the Wonder Woman book that I thought was lost that I found, thankfully. Oh, this art's good. Who is this artist? Martin Salvador. He's good. And they have a color section in the center called Descent into Hell. Esteban Moroto. I've got a messenger from someone. Messenger message. Yeah, there's several people interested in, in, in buying some of my art. If you want to commission me to do a piece of art, um, I've got a cool guy that wants to, me to do a black and white illustration. And then um, another great person that wants me to, uh, wants two of these paintings I showed the other day. And uh, I'm just trying to raise some extra money because uh, these are times of little bread. Otherwise, I might be tempted to go to that convention in uh, Des Moines. But if I went, I'd want to... When I go to Des Moines, I want to stop at uh, Winterset, where John Wayne's birthplace is, and go tour his, boy, his the home he was born in and the museum. And then I want to go farther to the Half Price Books. And then there are a few stores in Des Moines that I probably need to go to uh, 54 um, but okay I'm going to take these boxes out into the hall and then I'm ultimately going to move them into that room that was going to be my wife's office so I'm going to put a bunch of magazine boxes in there because um, this is starting to drive me mad Okay, creepy. <sighs> yes, am I the only person that thought of this? It's actually a very, uh, this is gigantic, uh, thing. I was late for the Four Color Fossil show on Wednesday, so I had him guest star until I could finish eating my corny dog, man. Okay. That's creepy. No, shit. Excuse me, excuse my language, ladies and gentlemen. I don't, I don't like to use profanity on this show. Okay, so this is a monster magazine, so it needs to go over there. This is a subculture kind of, uh, what is this? Well, it's got comics. It's more of kind of an underground kind of fanzine. What is it uh, centered on? 
it's kind of political. Um, I'd say it's a punk rock zine. Article on the flesh tones, whatever. A thing on exploitation films. Okay, so. I would put this with music magazines. Okay, here's some Sports Illustrated magazines that are mixed with the um, Monster magazines. So let's put these over here with those uh, other magazines I just pulled out. Okay. And so I'm gonna move these Monster magazines um, in with the Monster magazines. I showed these the other night. This one has DC Fontana's autograph on the front, uh, Star Trek writer, and, and did other things too. And uh, Buster Crab autograph inside. Okay, this one, I need to put with the Erie Publications magazines because this is from uh, Myron Foss. February 1962. Published by Tempest Publications. Yeah. Before it was called Erie Publications. Let's see. Myron Foss, uh, publisher. Let's see if there are any other names. Uh, Staff, Gloria Forrester, John Baskerville. Some of these are very clearly uh, pseudonyms. Dr. Gustav Mannheim, Yves Lassour, Jeffrey Von Loan Jr. European Research, Sir Nigel Conan. Oh, please. Irving Fass is the art director. Laura Carruthers is the art director. Mel Linney is the advertising rep. Maximus Leonidas is the production designer. Oh, please, man, that sounds like the name of a gladiator. Yeah, some people might not have wanted to put their real name on this publication. Can you imagine not wanting to take credit for such a fine publication? Okay, so the Erie Publications box is somewhere here. One of these boxes. Okay, here's the shitty Vanity Fair that needs to be put somewhere. See, I, I bought this before the Star Wars movie came out. How was I to know it was going to be a shitty movie? I was excited about it there in the late 90s, but... Oh, well. Okay, so this box has all these 1970s kid magazines like Dynamite, Banana Smash, but then it's got these uh, French... Uh, French Cine Fantastique Mad Movies magazines that are monster magazines essentially so I'm going to put them with the monster stuff oh here's more monster stuff I showed you this last time I do believe okay we're countdown how many days until Rob Zombie's amazing monsters movie um, Tuesday. I mean, I'm going to watch it. I'm a Munsters fanatic, but, you know, I'm sure I'm going to be unhappy. I don't know. If I, if I just approach it, this is going to be the worst piece of shit. Maybe I'll, there'll be something I like in it, you know? Approach everything like it's going to be horrible, and maybe you'll kind of, won't be as disappointed. <laughs> something like that. I heard that on Bewitched once. One of uh, Samantha's wise relatives told her that. and I forget how it was said. It's some famous cliche. Okay, this goes into this box here, Smash, which now has a different meaning. Uh, to the youngsters today, Smash means uh, having sex. But I remember this. In um, elementary school, the teachers would, uh, you know, you get these little pamphlets and with all the books you can order from your teacher. And I remember the teacher didn't want to order because it's a hassle, I guess, taking money and checks from the parents and what 
She just didn't want to hassle. But I wanted this fucking magazine. So one of the Karens, oh, I hate using that word because they're nice people named Karen. One of the mothers of one of the kids in the classroom decided, well, I'll, I'll do it. I'll order the books for the kids and I'll get, make sure the books get to the kids since the teacher doesn't want to do it. And I said, that's great because this is going to have these special Marvel uh, stamps in it. Now, uh, you look at uh, <laughs> when that fuck, each one, I guess, has different stamps in it, and then you've got to put them onto this little uh, sheet here. Well, notice it's not attached, and notice you can see that there's some missing from the bottom, so that I think the kid whose mother ordered these books went through everyone's magazine. He must have needed those stamps at the bottom, and... Uh, and took a whole row of stamps. I'm thinking, oh, I, I should try to mail letters with these. Uh, let's see which ones I have here. Uh, do I have any of those? The only one I have of, of, of these famous covers is that call. I think I have that warlock. Do I have that jungle action? No, I don't think so. I don't have that. Um, the ones that you could possibly get, you know, I'm trying to get this right now, this Captain Marvel number one. Let's see, it would have little comics in it. And... and uh... You know, Emergency, the Inside Story, that was a hit show on television at the time. That's, uh, this is Volume 1, Number 1, see Marvel Comics. So it's an article on Marvel Comics in here. Fan mags exposed. Yeah, this was exciting shit when you are in third grade. What, what month is this? Year? 1974, but what's the month? Oh, this is uh, Jeanette Kahn was the editor and publisher. And, and then she, a few years later, they got uh, her to be the head of DC Publications, the National. Uh, and they got her because she already was uh, doing this uh, marketing stuff to kids. Because. Uh, Comics are for kids. I think that's the problem I have with modern comics, How you, why they'll never be the same, is comics aren't marketed to kids anymore. Kids don't care about them, and uh, kids don't go into comic stores. Uh, Birth Order Blues, they've got Peanuts comic strips to illustrate it. And uh, so then it's not really the same. It's just not, uh, it's not fun. Okay. So what should I do here? Smash. There's dynamite. Dynamite was the big one. Then there's smash. That's another issue of smash. Then there was bananas. I think bananas was uh, that creepy idiot that does all the Goosebumps books. R.L. Stein, I think he was the guy behind Bananas. I, I never read a Goosebumps book. I'm sorry, those of you younger than me, you probably love... What the hell is this? Oh, God, is that Barry... There's like a whole poster of Barry Manilow in here. Uh, I think it's Barry Manilow. This was... Uh, this 1970s retro kind of art Who was the artist that did that. Lou Brooks, yeah. Jovial Bob Stein, he started in this. So the people that made these magazines later went on to some acclaim. Uh, there's a Planet of the Apes picture. Oh, yeah. A lot of, there was a lot of uh, coverage of comic books in these magazines. Suzanne Summers. Basically the whole, everything that was popular in the 70s is here. And this is, uh, you know, when Star Wars came out, the Bananas Yearbook. 
All about Linda Ronstadt backstage. How exciting. Here's that, looks like that, is that that same artist? Who's this artist? Banana Bob. What do they say? Close Encounters of the Bananas Kind. See, they're trying to mix fan magazines and Mad Magazine, everything that would appeal to kids. Rock and Roll Kiss, Elton Elvis. This is your story, Elton John. The Great Kiss Off. And then Marvel tried to do their own newsstand uh, version of these magazines, Pizzazz. I guess you could pronounce it Pizzazz. Here's uh, Spider-Man toasting all these idiots, all the popular people from the 70s. Yes, indeed. Oh, and the, these Pizzazz comics, I forgot. They had Young Tarzan, because Marvel had the rights to Edgar Rice Burroughs at the time. But they also had a Star Wars comic in here. So that may have some crossover appeal to Star Wars people. Then, of course, they would promote their Spider-Man show. Exciting. I'll show you these sometime if, if people say down below they want me to show them. Here's the way to live in it, John. This record, the story of Star Wars, I must have listened to that a million times as a kid. 1978. Yeah, I was buying this, and that's the year my wife was born, 78. That's a pretty good Hulk cover, and then you got Meatloaf. I don't think any of these other magazines covered Meatloaf. And then uh, Battlestar Galactica. This is kind of an interesting curiosity. I consider it the greatest honor of my long career to be on the cover of a Marvel magazine. I think this was right, possibly right before they had the Spider-Man versus Superman comic. And then uh, the Electric Company was the older sibling of this of Sesame Street from the children's television workshop but this magazine had some pretty nice production value and uh, and nice artwork you know it was it was pretty good and you know if you were forced to uh, like Al Jaffe did little fold-ins you know for, for it and uh, but, you know, Sesame Street was supposed to teach numbers and letters to deprived kids in the inner city that weren't, uh, had no uh, parents around to teach them that. And instead of eating paint chips off the wall and cockroaches off the floor, they could watch Sesame Street. I didn't realize as a kid that it was really mar being marketed to inner city kids, but if you think about it, the way they show the inner city and the clips they should mix in but because they decided that kids were watching lots of television and they would make it short little clips like television commercials and that was their thing but anyway electric company once you graduate sesame street this is supposed to teach you phonics then phonics became uh like a curse word to teachers like you shouldn't teach kids phonics it doesn't work of course it had worked for many generations but they said you need to Kids need to learn language, uh, learn to read through something called whole language, where they look at a word and they identify the word by looking at the word, not by sounding it out. 
So uh, that became a very controversial thing. And then they would put out a program called Hooked on Phonics, and they would advertise it during like Rush Limbaugh because it became a very right-wing, reactionary, conservative, retro, uh, throwback, caveman way of teaching phonics. And, but all well, the parents are saying, no, it worked for me, so I'm going to get this program since the damn teacher won't teach my kid to read properly. And they're years behind, so they'd order Hooked on Phonics from the conservative talk radio shows. And it, it became a big political thing. Or It's kind of like CRT, you know, now they don't want kids to learn about cathode ray tubes, you know. How else are they going to be able to fix an old television? Anyway, I've been wearing that joke with them. I have some more electric companies, and I've got some Sesame Street magazines, too, that when I find them will go in this box. But for right now... I'm about to lose my mind. I need a yeah. Let's get this ceiling fan on, ladies and gentlemen. It's very hot in here. Okay. Oh, there's more monster magazines. I need a blank box. I'm an empty box to fill it with monster magazines. Well, here's a box lid without anything written on it. That's good. Now I just need the box. Ugh, what is this shit? Oh, this has got some good stuff in it. I keep finding these alter ego magazines all over the place and I need to get them all together. I guess I bought more copies of Alter Ego than I realized, because every time I would go in Lone Star Comics, um, my local comic store, I'd look at all the new comics, and there'd be nothing I wanted, and then there'd be one issue of Alter Ego. It was like it was ordered just for me, because they figured it's only gonna, that's only going to sell to maybe one person. And I was the person. So... Okay, are there empty boxes in here? What is in this box? Oh, some Savage Sword of Conan's. In the Comics Journal, Blazing Combat Monsters in the Moot. Oh, shit. Okay. What's in here? Kiss Magazine. Oh, Dirty. I better not show you that. I moved this TV down from the attic yesterday, and um, luckily we have an elevator. I would never have gotten it down here. Um, This is a box of like music magazines. Um, looks like Newsweek. Oh man, I got into subscription to Entertainment Tonight one time from, I mean Entertainment Weekly, and uh, I got so many of those freaking magazines. Take this box in the other room. Oh.
God damn it. Okay. Okay, what is in this damn box? There's a whole magazine about faster pussycat kill kill. This song by the Bostweeds is great. It's got all kinds of great pictures. I, uh, it could be a Japanese magazine. That's kind of a hint. Yeah, I think in Japan they really like this movie. Plus they have a, one of the three girls is, well actually Tura Satana is, I think she's Hispanic. As I recall, and she's Jap. The uh, no wonder the Japanese love this. Okay, so this is some British magazine, Sky International. Let's move this over here. Oh my gosh, that's, that's not good. You don't want to see that. Okay, these are magazines like Ben is Dead. That was a good magazine. Issue 27, Retro Hell. So it's a whole issue about retro stuff. Yeah, that was a cool magazine. And then there's this magazine, The Brutarian. A lot of great magazines. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. You don't want to see that. Carbon 14 has articles on and Andre Williams, Davey Allen, and Johnny Legend. Electric Frankenstein. This is kind of a music magazine, but it's really about, uh, it's just a, about culture in general. That's kind of a cool painting. This is a more fan style magazine about bachelor pad music, you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, here, I guess the, here they're, you can order these, like some of them pretty high, these, these, a lot of them had these girly covers. Some of them even had Betty Page on the cover. Okay, so these, these, I guess I bought this at a, half price books. I'll put it in there with a dynamite because it's like a magazine aimed at teenagers. Oh, I bought this because it has an article on the cramps. So these are music magazines in here. Let me get the music magazines out and I'm going to put them somewhere else. Um, Stinky magazine. This was a good magazine, Teenage Gang Devs. It was all about early, you know, it's like, it's a, from the Partridge Family Coloring Book. And here's a whole article on dynamite. We were just talking about dynamite. They did a whole article on it. So, this was shit. These were magazines from the 90s, aimed at people my age, who were nostalgic for their childhood with the Brady Bunch. And, Uh, here's a whole article on remember this this fucking idiot here this guy what was he was in uh, was he on the Brady Bunch for like one at the end or something I hated that guy whoever the hell he is Robbie Wrist 
Do you remember uh, Rodney Allen Rippey? Whatever happened to that guy? Here's Thorazine, another music magazine. It's got James Brown on the cover. Now this is more of a men's adventure magazine, so this needs to go in the men's adventure uh, box. And it's like, uh, but this is in January of 73, so they're starting to be a little bit more Playboy-like. Uh, uh, this is not, not as good as the older stuff from the 50s and 60s. Okay, well, I'll put that there. I'll add the spastic culture to this pile. Why do I own this? Oh my God. I, I can't even, this must, Star Wars Galaxy Collector. This must have been before the Star Wars Episode One came out and I didn't know it was gonna be that bad. Eh, I'll put it there. Now this needs to be this needs to be with my comic book books because look it's a whole article on Atlas Seaboard. It's comic book marketplace number seventy seven from April two thousand. See it shows all the magazines they put out. Um, I think I have that, but where the fuck is it? I know I've got the one with Doctor Zayas. I don't have the Phantom one. I've got that one. I don't have either, or do I? I have the weird both of the weird tales of the macabre. But see, these are things I need to get. It's showing me things I need to get. I don't like this. But it shows all the different covers of all the Atlas Seaboard magazines. Yeah, this is fucking great. Okay. And let's go with the comic book magazines. Here's another one of those catalogs I was showing last episode uh, that has all this original art you can buy for what is now ridiculously uh, low prices. Man, this is just sad. If I had only won the lottery back 30 years ago, then I'd have a, a Boris Vallejo painting done for the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, paperback, The Monster Men. Oh, it's a prelim. prelim uh, so it's, it's like an early version of it. $1,250, which is a lot of money to me now, but that's not a lot of money for an original painting by... Uh, Someone like Boris Vallejo. Here's a Wally Wood. Damn. Uh, look, Frankenstein drawing. $200, 9x5 ink wash. Oh my gosh. But I have this little catalog, so I, uh, I feel like I kind of own art. Okay. Where could I put these? I used to buy this model and toy collector, and it was about uh, toys and model kits you could buy. I have this Vampira, um, except the one I have was altered by the person that built it in, into uh, her being topless. Or, or maybe they made two versions, I don't know. But the, yeah, then kit builders, I think I'll throw these in that box with the dynamites. Kit builders. So I'm clearing this box out to make it a uh, monster box. I didn't like that Batman design at all. But this is the kind of stuff I would buy in lieu of comic books because the comics had turned so shitty. Uh, this is a uh, they have like 20 different Vampirella model kits. And then this, I bought that, but it didn't look like the photograph when you got it. Okay, model kits, action figure quarterly. These are all gonna go over here. Uh. So how are you guys doing on this wonderful sunny uh, Sunday afternoon? I, oh, I hope um, all you guys, so a bunch of you in the in the comic book communist community, commie, uh, com, whatever you call it, the, the community of comic book collectors, the comic book fam, the, a bunch of you live in Florida, and I hear there's a hurricane heading 
uh, there in the middle of this week that starts tomorrow, I hope. You guys are all okay. And, um, so why do I own a Victoria's Secret catalog? Probably because of that, I guess, and that. <laughs> I can't explain it. Why would I do that? Here's Bats Magazine. Yeah, I rescued one of these little critters about three or four weeks ago here. Uh, not for sale. Read in store. <laughs> Who the fuck does that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then I don't know. Do I throw this? As soon as I throw this away, it'll become super valuable. So you get the, they're super thick. How do you fucking store these things? It's from October 93, which is, maybe it has the first appearance of Deadpool in it. Anyway, this is uh, like a previews kind of thing, but it's uh, even thicker. And it's printed on like coloring book kind of paper. So it has a wonderful smell though. I'll put that with the comic book stuff. Oh, see, this is what I was talking about. Like, Real West is something... These Real West kind of magazines would go perfectly in a box with this thing with Robert E. Lee. By the way, Robert E. Lee was an ancestor of mine. Ooh, these are inappropriate magazines. <laughs> Let's put those somewhere else. My goodness. Oh, this is a, a little uh, catalog from the Fang. Back in the days, uh, this is 1993, and that's before DVDs. And so this was a guy that had all these great movies on VHS that you could get from him, the Fang. And they were mostly rock and roll oriented and, and horror oriented. And that's how you get these movies. And that's why I was so disappointed when Mystery Science Theater 3000 started is they would have some of these movies but they would talk over them and it was less obnoxious when they put out the DVDs of the shows because they'd have on one side of the disc the movie unexpurgated untalked over and the other side they'd joke over it then I could go along with the humor and everything but don't ruin my only chance you know of course now I have the brain that wouldn't die oh a great movie that's a great movie in many formats I have it on VHS DVD Blu-ray but Anyway, the Fang was a cool guy that, uh, where would I put this? Oh, it's with, uh, Sinister Cinema was another company that did that, that, that sold VHS of these movies, um. Uh, and they, the great thing about it is there's all these ad mats in it. So, you know, you can use them, you can make copies from this and use these ads in your fanzines. Of course, no one does fanzines anymore, but anyway. So that's Sinister Cinema. I was on the, yikes, the mailing list of Sinister Cinema, so I saved all their catalogs. Here's the 1994-95 one. Eventually they got slicker. This is printed on blue paper, but you can still make photocopies from it. This 95, 96 one. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight. I'll just keep these in the box because uh, 98, 99, because if I put, th th these would go well with the monster magazines. And this was one called Video Vault. And so they have a little bit slicker catalog. And they, they have all kinds of movies in here. It looks like they sold, uh, and then uh, sold more uh, legitimate releases. Okay, this is Cycle World from April 65. I need to put that with the Hot Rod Motor magazines. And then, uh, this is a Lowrider magazine. Again, I'll put that with the car magazines. 
And this looks like a magazine of my father's. My father must have been subscribed to the retired officer, but I kept this because it has cartoons of World War II in it. So that'll go with the comics stuff. All right, but this here, music stuff. there. Okay. Retired officer goes with the comic stuff. Oh, here's another copy of Dynamite. Bruce Lee lives. One of the cooler covers. There's another one with a Slee stack on the cover. That may be the best of the, and it's got a Bruce Lee poster, same. Um, so this is, um, Number 17. Oh, look at this. Six million dollar man and Jamie Summers arm wrestling. Yeah, everything that was popular in the 70s is here. Oh, that's when Fonzie and Pinky Tuscadero fell in love. Remember that? I'll show you all the insides of these if you want to, Captain and Tennille. John Travolta. But let's go earlier to find that sleece that cover. This might be why I love those Amish people all the time, because it just feels like the cast of Little House on the Prairie are, are shopping in the supermarket right next to you. And, and they've got their horse-drawn little cart outside. This is, uh, what was the name of this guy? Count uh, Testicula or something. He was uh, this real 1970s looking vampire cartoon. Count, uh, Count Testicles, right? Something like that. Count Morbida, that's right. Count Morbida. Oh, look. The origin of Iron Man. They'd always have, like, a, they'd fill you in on the origin of one of the Marvel superheroes and, and then answer questions, which helped you as a kid because there weren't all these reprints in existence in, uh, what is this? This is June of 1975. So the end of the school year of fourth grade is when this came out. Where is my Sleestack cover, man? I may have pulled it and put it somewhere into another box because I showed it off on one of the... I can't believe it. Here's the first time the Six Million Dollar Man was on the cover. That's pretty cool. Where is the sleigh stack, mother? Focus. Nine. John Denver, J.J. Walker. There's um, Tony Orlando and Dawn. I like this show with David McCollum. It was Ilya Kuryakin and Man from Uncle. He was the Invisible Man for at least a few months before they canceled it. Okay, MASH is number 19. Yeah, I've got Slee Stack somewhere else. 18, 17. This is why I've got to get organized, man. Okay, this mon famous monsters needs to go in the closet. <sighs> These monster worlds are technically part of famous monsters run. So uh, let me get these together. 
eight. This is the great cover that everyone's got to get. Number six, number seven, number seven here. Number uh, eight. I mean, I don't know. I, it, the, the Munsters trailer looks terrible, you have to admit. But maybe, I think what he's trying to do, Rob Zombie, is trying to make the movie look like these covers with these bright, vibrant colors. I think that's what he's trying to do because he is a big fan of Basil Gogos and uh, all these uh, guys. Um, but I don't not encouraged. Here's uh, Famous Monsters 129. Here's Erie. March 1977-82 with the uh, first appearance of the Rook. I think I already have a copy of this. I probably shouldn't have bought that. Here's Famous Monsters 1964 yearbook. Here's Spaceman 1965 yearbook. I'm gonna put that here. There's another famous monsters. Um, I should make a giant poster of this and put it behind me so I can stage a rally. Like when I run for president, I'll have a rally like Trump, but I'll have a bunch of I'll have this behind me and look like they're my crowd. Um, oh man. Oh no, never mind. I thought they misspelled a word, but I'm probably wrong. Okay, Jameis Monsters, 80. Oh, here's another creepy. Creepy 21. Okay, here's Monster World number four, which I showed you last time, and number nine. Four, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, there's another one. Number ten. Okay, these books that we saw last time, I'll put with the music magazines. These catalogs that we saw last time, I'll put with the uh, comic stuff, which is there. That's eerie, goes here. This really feels good to start getting organized. I could never really do it back in the old country because the, uh, blah, I didn't have enough space. This is music. <laughs> I didn't notice this, I showed it last time. And many more nearly naked people. Okay, High Fidelity goes with the music magazines. I'll put this in with, in the back behind the Dynamite kind of magazines. Whew. 
boy, I sure am weird. Look, I'm listening to roller rink music. Boy, I sure am weird. I'm probably the weirdest person on YouTube, man. I'm sure weird. Don't you hate when people call themselves weird? Okay, I don't have a lot of sports magazines. Where should I put sports magazines? Damn, fucking piss. Um, I'll put it with... Hot Rod magazines, or maybe with the Old West magazines, because they're all kind of manly, machismo kind of things. And of course, this John Wayne Gun World needs to go with the Macho He-Man books. Okay. These fanzines for uh, Ultraman Common Rider kind of things that I showed you last time. I think I'll put those with my um, my magazine, The Sophisticate. Where? Where? I'll put them here. Okay, this Johnson Smith catalog I'll put with the comic stuff. Time is it, man? Uh, Eleven forty-eight. It's not even noon yet. I think the car show starts about uh, four four p.m. <laughs> okay, some hot rod magazines. Okay, I need to get rid of these famous monsters real quick. Let's go in the closet. Ugh. Hopefully there'll be room. I think there's three boxes of, or at least two boxes of famous monsters over here in the closet. I may not keep them here. I may take these boxes and put them in another room and then put board games here. But for right now, I got, where did the other box go? There was another box here. Oh, that was creepy. I think I took the creepy out, maybe. Or is it here? What is this box? These look like Alter Ego magazines. Yeah. Alter Ego. Comics Journal, Eerie, The Spirit. There's a box of National Lampoons there. Oh, there's the Curse of Frankenstein, Horror of Dracula that I was talking about the other day. This is a, a makeup handbook that Dick Smith put together. What else is in here? Oh, that's that shouldn't be in here. That's a offensive magazine. Why are there Playboys in the Famous Monsters box? Get them out of here. Okay. These need to go somewhere else, man. They're offensive, man. That's offensive shit, man. Okay, now I have room. Damn, 
what were the... I'm just going to put Famous Monsters, and then I'm going to put Monster World. I know technically it's part of their run, but... So, here go the Monster Worlds into the box. Sure enough, let's see. And then these two uh, yearbooks. Let's see, do I already have the 1964 yearbook? This is the 66... 68 before 66 what kind of math is that 66 yearbook there's a 65 <laughs> that's not in very good shape man oh here's one in a little bit better shape 65 yearbook okay so the 64 yearbook I got at Canesville collectibles is uh, pretty good shape and then I have a 1971 yearbook. Okay, this is the 69. That's the 1970 yearbook. So here's the 1971 yearbook. Yeah, sure is. And then, uh, let's see. This is 129. Yikes! So here's 123. 128. Okay, there's some 129 that's in better shape, but oh, it looks like I have three copies of this issue. Is that word misspelled where it says exciting sequel? Isn't sequel U E L? Or am I wrong? I'm probably wrong. Probably that's spelled. You see that? Is that misspelled sequel? I don't know. It looks wrong to me, but I'm probably wrong. Uh, I guess I don't write the word sequel out very often. Okay, Famous Monsters 80. Let me move some of these to the next box. Ooh. This is a this is a pretty high dollar issue, or at least it was. There were a lot of Japanese collectors that wanted that issue. I remember that. I mean, not people from Japan, but people that collect or that are fans of Japanese kaiju movies, I should say. Okay, so number eighty. There's 91. Sixty-seven. There's about 87. 83. 81. 68. 69. 81. The reason why there are no, I don't have any ones in the 70s is Monster World. The run of Monster World account for famous monsters like one through, uh, like in the 70s. There are no famous monsters of film land in the 70s. They're, uh, they count Monster World as that uh, part of that run. And look, I found, uh, damn, I found these in the underground box here, all these. I don't think I'm going to count these as underground books, but I'm going to put them over here in the independent books uh, section. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Piss. Motherfucker. Excuse my language, ladies and gentlemen. Try not to curse on this family program. Um, okay. Here's this alter, alter ego. Needs to go with the comic stuff. Okay. Now I can put these hot rod magazines together. Okay. Okay, so now I'm developing a, some hot rod. Shit. 
I guess I'll put the cartoons with the hot rod magazines. And these are, I'm sure where Mike has all of these. These were, well, a lot of you do. I would go into Lone Star Comics before they uh, closed up, sold over to Wild West Comics. And this is Craig Yo. He put out this great book that would reprint the 50s pre-code horror in, in, in color. And I don't, I would try to, there's issue six, there's issue seven. I, I tried to buy every copy I found. Looks like I got two copies of seven. But then it looks like I went to 14. So I need to find these. And uh, the ones I missed, I have no idea why I would be missing these. What what, what was fucking wrong with me? Here's uh, 25. So there's a lot of uh, these, unless some of them are already in these boxes. Yeah, but I, I don't have a complete set of them. That's unforgivable. All right. Okay, here's some more that need to go in the closet. These board games might be better here. I may move these boxes into that office. So. Um, this, <laughs> I don't know what, this, um, this is weird. This, I don't know. I, I'm not even going to wonder. Okay. Mole people. Curse of Frankenstein. Mole People goes in. Horror of Party Beach. Monster Madness. That was a Marvel horror book. I'll put that in the other room. This is the first issue of Monster World. And then, um, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so um, 10. I have two copies of 10. And this is issue two, this Munsters one. Okay. Oh, these are all my uh, oh, damn. Uh, made it through the move all my uh, treasury editions and stuff down under here okay this box here is underground comics I need to get these filed in here <clears throat> let's do that now <clears throat> Okay, this is a rip-off press number five, Wonder Warthog. This is this is a two. Okay. Some of these covers I really can't show on a family program, but I can show you some of them. Like um, this Gray Morrow book, uh, Amora. Um. I don't know that this would be underground anti-Hitler comics. It's reprints. Yeah, I'm going to move this to the independent. Um, but, you know, something like this, Bicentennial Gross Outs, that would count as an underground. Looks like I have two copies of that. Wow. And, uh... 
in this eight ball, I've got, how do you, it's not really underground. I've got some eight balls over there and some here. I didn't know how to, where to put it, I guess. And there's hate. There's um, our crumb. Here's a European horror book, Horror. That's, and this is a great Richard Corbin cover. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, something looks like this is going to be underground. Purple Cat. And this, I think you called this ground level. Quack. It's um, it's not, like, super offensive. It's got a story to the Rabbit Wonder by Sergio Aragonas and Steve Lealoa. Yeah, this, is, uh, this would have been a purchase from Lone Star Comics when they first opened around 1977. And I don't know that a Rat Fink comic would be underground. I, I don't know how to... Maybe I should put all these undergrounds in with the independents. I, I don't know. Rip-off. Oh, there's more rip-off comics. There's Rip in Time from Corbin. Um, rip-off comics number one. I like Wonder Warthog. Okay, so, but we're going to put seven in here. Five, six, seven... Wait, this is a different ripoff. This is actually called Underground Classics, but I'm gonna put it right after the ripoff comics. Okay. What else do I have to file here? Sloyd Comics. Number, uh, now these were kept in print all through the 70s. This is a fifth printing. I mean, these were printed over and over again, so. There's an underground price guide, but it, it's a good 20, 30 years old. I don't really know what... I mean, obviously, the older the printings, the earlier the printings, the more valuable it is.